Happy spring, everyone. In six and a half minutes, I think. For those of you that have just joined us, I'm John Grant. I'm the chairman of the Earth, uh, Center for Earth and Planetary Studies here in the museum. And I'd like to welcome you all to the first Exploring Space lecture of 2007. We have a great lineup again, made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. This year's sponsors are Ball Aerospace and Technologies Corporation and Aerojet, <clears throat> with contributions by NASA. These groups are represented here tonight by Carol Lane from Ball Aerospace, Susie Stenner and Jim Long from Aerojet, and Marianne Alberg from NASA. We thank you all for your support. And that brings us to tonight's lecture. We're fortunate to have with us Dr. Mike Brown from Caltech, where his areas of interest are planetary astronomy, the outer solar system, and extrasolar planets. I keep looking down because these lights are incredibly blinding, so I hope you can. Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> he is a recipient of the prestigious uh, Yuri Prize of the American Astronomical Society and is named one of the world's 100 most influential people by Time Magazine, which is really quite an accomplishment. Uh, he'll speak to us tonight about the mysterious objects he's discovered in the outer uh, regions of our solar system. And I personally am very much looking forward to this. Please welcome Mike Brown. <laughs> so the, I, I just have to say that the, of the uh, that hundred most influential people in 2006 has always been particularly strange for me because I really am only the, the third most influential person in my house. So uh, I'm not sure what that really means. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, <clears throat> some of these things we've been finding about, about Pluto. And, and of course, everybody knows about Pluto's demotion. And so I'm going to try to answer some of those questions that some of the people had earlier uh, about exactly um, what happened to Pluto and, and why. And um, my goal is to convince you that, that this was the right thing. We'll, we'll see if, uh, if I can do better with you than I can, could with the kids last week. Um, the story starts. Uh, in um, the, the early part of the last century. And uh, it starts with um, the searches for Planet X. Planet X was this uh, almost mythological object that was thought to be out in space, out beyond Neptune. And Neptune itself had been found when astronomers had noticed that Uranus didn't quite travel around the sun precisely how it was supposed to. It was being tugged a little bit by something. And that something was Neptune. And once, once you realize that Neptune was tubbing, tugging on Uranus, it seemed an obvious extension to go look for the thing that might be tugging on Neptune and see what's out there. And so astronomers uh, diligently calculated where this thing might be and uh, went to, this, uh, to the Mount Wilson Observatory that's uh, like in, uh, just, just above my, my hometown of Pasadena and took a picture of the sky that looked an awful lot like this. Oops, that's the alternative title. I forgot to tell you the alternative title. Here's why it had it coming, because the pictures, they look like this. So there it is. Right? Oh, you don't see it? So that's, um, that's uh, this was what the picture looked like when the astronomers were looking for this planet X. But they thought they were looking for something big. They thought a planet is going to be maybe this big. If Saturn were in this picture, it would be something like this with rings out to here. And they took pictures of the sky. They looked like a bunch of stars and um, went back to the drawing board for, for decades trying to figure out why their calculations were wrong. These days, we actually know that their calculations were wrong because there actually are no perturbations to Neptune and the data were just faulty. So not, Neptune is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's, it's doing fine. But in the meantime, um, Clyde Tombaugh was, was hired fresh off the farm in Kansas at, to, to go to Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff to look for this planet X. And he took pictures that looked like this. And he realized that he's not going to be able to tell what's a planet and what's not a planet unless he has a better way of, of doing it. And he realized that if it's a planet out there, if you take a picture one night and you take a picture the next night, all the stars, all the galaxies, everything else are going to stay in place. But the planet's going to move, sort of like that. If you guys saw that right. All right, let's try this again. Night one, night two. Anybody see it? Yeah, liars. Night one. <laughs> Night two, the fourth time seems to always work. I'm not sure why. Night one. <laughs> Night two. 
So there it is, without the arrows, night one, night two. This tiny little dot that I always lose, it's this one, right? Okay, that tiny little dot, that's Pluto. These are actually the discovery images of Pluto um, um, from 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. And it is a tiny, tiny little dot compared to the other stars that are out there. And <coughs> astronomers at the time were trying to understand why they, they still thought Neptune was being pulled along by something massive, so they thought that Pluto itself was probably quite massive, and it just looks small. And they they were uh, they were a little crazier back then than we are today. I, I, I like to think. And so they came up with some really wacky ideas on why it looks so small. My favorite of the wacky ideas was that it was actually um, it was a planet with a huge iron core and a liquid oxygen ocean. But liquid oxygen, of course, is is transparent, so all you see is the iron core and not the liquid oxygen ocean. Why you would get a planet with an iron core and a liquid oxygen ocean, no one really tried to explain. Um, but, it, but it turns out there's actually a very good reason why Pluto looks so small. Any guesses? <laughs> you guys have seen this talk before. Um, it is small. Pluto is smaller than the moon. It looks like this tiny dot because it actually does not have a liquid oxygen ocean extending out to here. But it really is just a, a small thing, about half the size of the moon. and um, and, and it's really uh, a, a fairly insignificant body compared to many, many other objects in the solar system. What's more, if you looked at its orbit around the sun, if you look first at the giant planets, here's Jupiter, um, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all in their very nice, regular, circular orbits around the sun. Um, you put Pluto into the mix, and Pluto has this very strange orbit. Pluto sneaks inside the orbit of Neptune at one point, it goes all the way out here, much further away. It's, uh, it's very elongated. And what I'm not showing you, if you, if you took this and you tilted it on its side, um, Pluto is also tilted by about 20 degrees from the disk that the other planets are in. So it didn't quite fit. It was too small to really fit the pattern of the other planets. It didn't really quite have the same sort of orbit as the other planets. So there was a little bit of a struggle, even back in 1930, as to what to call it. Here, here are all the planets. Um, here's the, 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 where their sizes. Here's the, the big Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and even a couple of little asteroids strewn in through here. If you add Pluto down in the bottom corner here, Pluto is just this tiny little thing sitting down there. It's not very significant compared to these other things. But there's nothing else out there. What are you going to call it? You're not going to call it. An asteroid, here are all the asteroids in here between Mars and Jupiter. Um, you're not going to call it a comet. It doesn't look like a comet. So really, there was nothing else to call it except for a planet. So in 1930, it was declared to be, be the, uh, the ninth planet. Uh, they named it after a, a cartoon dog. Um, and they, oh, it was the other way around, sorry. And, um, and it stayed a planet in, in good standing for about, uh, about 76 years. In 1992, um, it was suddenly realized that Pluto had company. For, for most of that time before that, Pluto seemed to be this lonely oddball at the very edge of the solar system. In 1992, the first new object out beyond Neptune was discovered. And, and soon after that, uh, hundreds and hundreds of these objects were discovered. These are all, all of these little diamonds are objects. Again, here's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Each of these little objects is an object, uh, the diamonds is, a, is an object that some astronomer found doing exactly the same thing that Clyde Tombaugh did. Take a picture, come back, take another picture, come back, take another picture. And uh, there, there are now more than 1,200 of these objects known in this region that we now call the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is sort of like the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is in here, in this region. Um, only the objects are generally made out of, of ice and rock instead of just being big rocky bodies like the asteroid in this region out here. And in fact, the Kuiper Belt beyond Neptune, um, you can see some of these objects have actually snuck their way inward. All of these guys started out in here and probably at some point had a, a close encounter with Neptune. And just like when we send a, a spacecraft out to, to go to Pluto, we, we swing by Jupiter and we get a little slingshot outward. If you go by Neptune, you can get slingshot inward. And these guys are all on their way in to become comets. This is one of the places where comets are stored before they come into the inner solar system to be seen.